Good evening. Welcome to the Digital Memory Studies Association November 2021 online event series, or also known as DMSA. My name is Nastasia Felker, and I'm a historian and a heritage scholar, and I currently work at the Vera and Donaldinkin Open Society Archives at CU in Budapest. You see a lot of uh, archival boxes um, right here, and I'm very glad to welcome you all at this roundtable discussion that is entitled A Personal View. What does memory studies make of private archives, artists, estates, and diaries? And today we have three panelists who are uh, Lana Mavrencic, Anna Topolska, and Jana Mazurkevich Mizarosh. And all three of them, as scholars, specialize, of course, among other in memory studies. But at the same time, all three of them separately, of course, also preserve and curate private archives of an artist, um, Peter Dabat of a historian Jerzy Topolski and of a writer and actor Henrik Grindak. Now, today the panelists will be discussing the importance of private archives, artists' estates and diaries for memory studies, and also different approaches to private and personal material, as well as the value of this material for researchers, artists, and the public today. Let me first present the panelists, and then I will ask each uh, of them to present the, their cases or cases of the archives that they curate. And then we will follow with the discussion and hopefully we'll have enough time for uh, Q&A with the audience. Uh, let me start with our first panelist, Lana Robetic, uh, who is the art historian affiliated with the Institute of Art History in Zagreb. And she's also a co-founder uh, of the POSACOMIS working group here at the MSA. Lana is one of the initiators uh, of the International Collaborative uh, Platform in Appropriate Monuments, uh, and she's currently working uh, on her PhD on the topic of private photographic archives, and her main field of interest are photography, cultural heritage, memory practices, and planning practices after the Second World War. Our second panelist is Anna Topolska, who is a historian of modern Eastern Europe, and she's based in Poznan. Her research interests focus on visual studies and memory, and she's working on her first, currently working on her first monograph, Memory and Visuality, Representation of the Second World War in Poznan in the 20th and 21st centuries. And uh, Anna is also co-editor uh, of the book uh, on Jerzy Topolski, Theory and Methodology of Historical Knowledge. And this is a forthcoming volume. And finally, uh, last but not least, of course, our third panelist is Jana Mazurkevich Nisarosh, who is a scholar of Yiddish theater, and she's based in San Diego. Lana is a PhD, uh, Jana, sorry, is a PhD candidate of, at, in the Slavic uh, department at, at the University of Michigan in Arbor, and she works there on her dissertation on Yiddish theater in communist Warsaw. Jana is also a theater artist, critic, director, and a producer of the Yiddish Theater, and uh, back in 2017, she launched the Yiddish Arts and Academic Association uh, of North America, and also a Yiddish Theater Academy. Now, uh, let uh, me first ask Lana to start with her case study, and also introduce the archive that she creates, the private archive. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much for this introduction, Anastasia. And uh, so I will um, show the archive that I'm uh, working in for the last uh, four years. It will be five now. And it is the private archive of Peter Dabat. So first to give you a bit of a context, uh, Peter Dabat is photographer. He is born in 19, uh, 1942. So, uh, and he's one of the most important photographers uh, in the 70s, 80s, uh, Croatia, former Yugoslavia, Croatia, and uh, then, of course, after the 90s in uh, today's Croatia. And uh, what is um, important and why this archive is so significant are a couple of uh, reasons. Uh, what I like to start with is the, the context, how the archive actually came into being and what uh, it, con it uh, has in it. So Peter Dabat, he's not only a photographer, but he's also a culture worker with his long artistic career. He's still here, thank God, and uh, uh, he's still working in his archive. Uh, besides doing his own artwork and uh, preserving all of the materials that he created 
as part of the working process or uh, uh, he's exhibiting pieces, he was also documenting the scene because he was uh, working as a professional photographer and this was his way of earning his living. So uh, his archive also contains a lot of photographs from different exhibition openings, uh, retro photographs for monographs and books, but also some photographs of factories and uh, propaganda photographs that he was selling. Besides that, there are also private photographs, pri private uh, correspondences, letters, some kind of uh, um, cards and postcards that he also uh, uh, compiled. Then we also are talking about a lot of material connected with the artist with which whom he associated. So uh, works of art of different artists. But as he ca comes from a family that was uh, that were art lovers all together, there is also a big collection of uh, paintings, sculptures, but also some traditional furniture, historical furniture and so on. So it is a big, a big collection. Um, he started to be active professionally during the 60s and he was actually formed and educated uh, in photography in the uh, studio of his uncle Tosho Dabats, who is on his behalf, uh, one of the most notable uh, photographs of the previous generation of the 50s and the 60s uh, Yugoslavia, you can see it here and there he learned his uh, photographic skills and so on. But as Tosho Dabats had this high profile studio for photography, he had everything pretty much arranged. So he learned here how to uh, organize photographic materials, you know, in photographic studios, it was necessary that you can easily access the photograph you need to show the positive to a a client or something and then to look for the negative pretty uh, fast as well. So this is his first, um, how to say, uh, contact with the structure of the, an archive and he actually is also a really methodical figure and he finished um, engineering. Uh, in fact, so he has this kind of, you know, uh, methodical sense of him. And after his uh, uncle died, he inherited his own archive. So he started to build his archive while parallelly arranging the uh, photo, uh, photo studio of his uncle into an archive. And his archive was kind of an organic uh, addition to the older archive. And this is how it was created. Um, Throughout his work, and he worked, uh, he showed really uh, different kind of approaches to photography. I will show you some of his work so you can see the diversity, uh, which is characteristic to him. Um, he was also really much into the historical uh, photographic uh, techniques. So he was doing restorations of photography and so on and preservation of material. But also he was constantly promoting his uncle's archive. And then in the end, he, this archive was bought by the city of Zagreb. So in 2006, after 36 years of these two archives living together in a photographic studio in Zagreb center, he actually extracted his material and moved it into his own private house. And these are the photographs from the archives where you can see how it is arranged in some of the places in the house. It's a house of 130 square meters and almost every room is filled with some parts of it. So these are some of the works of Peter Daba so that you can see he was part of this conceptual artistic practices uh, that emerged in the 70s and um, he did really important and then exciting works, uh, analytical photographic works. Um, <clears throat> These are, for instance, uh, fluorophotoxerographies that he did. So in the archive, you can see this kind of work, but you can also uh, trace the, the processes that he used and the way in which he created uh, his own work. 
So from 1967 to this day, he has collected a wide, wide uh, range of items that can be divided into several interconnected, but cl clearly the delineated ensembles. Uh, and we can thus distinguish documents which trace the artistic path of Peter Dabat's segment related to contemporary art production in Yugoslavia and abroad, documentation regarding the activities of gallery that he managed for 20 years from the 80s onwards, documentation regarding his own educational activities as he was uh, teaching from the 90s on a faculty of arts in Ljubljana, material related to the stu uh, studio and the archive of his uncle and the uh, uh, posthumous exhibitions of the old master that he curated, and also legal and financial documents, private correspondences, letters, and so on. As he is a photographer, then I also make a distinguish between the photo material that is preserved in this um, archive. So connected to this uh, separation of types of material, we have uh, four segments of different kinds of photographic uh, materials here, which is uh, which are for Peter Dabat's own artworks. These are experiments, authors, blow ups, objects and items, uh, negatives, then his private photographs portraying for members of his family and friends and his number of travels. Then commissioned photography, as I mentioned earlier, such as the exhibitions or um, commercial work, and then a photography collection of other artists. And added to all of this, um, there is a big library of books and catalogs, uh, paintings, graphics, and sculptures that also should be added to the corpus. So this is really a, a short, like kind of, uh, just to show you the vast scape, scope of this material. So I started to work with this material because it was connected to a specific project, a project that was mapping the change. Um, it was actually mapping conceptual practices that involve photography on the European rim. And uh, this is when I first uh, saw his archive and started to work on, this particular segment. But as I was going through this archive with the artist himself, and we were watching the photos, uh, you know, looking at the books, um, stories connected not only to his life, but to the whole cultural scene of the Yugoslavia in the period and later Croatia, but also with uh, Slovenian photographic scene and uh, also Austrian photographic scene as he was really tightly connected and still is with Camera Austria and Graz. It opened this uh, um, like a map of networks and intertwinements and in the period which you know most of us have this conception of this firm borders the east and west division uh, we had this vibrant network of artists, culture workers, um, galleries, and other cultural institutions that were uh, working together, exchanging opinions, exchanging exhibitions. And this could be traced in his own archive, while in the official art history and in the official history of photography in Croatia. Uh, today, this is not yet researched. And since you know, art history is kind of really um, conservative discipline in itself. The whole concept of how we approach different artists is like through this monographical uh, approach, you know, of seeing an artist and only his artwork rarely taking into account uh, the context and all of the context and exchanging of ideas and, and uh, let's say influences between uh, him and other uh, colleagues of him, uh, he's in the scene. And so I actually started to think in which way this kind of material and this kind of artist, uh, this kind of archive is providing, not providing, but in which way is it possible to extract more knowledge than with uh, this classical art historian approach of monographical uh, research and how the structure of the art uh, of the archive itself is actually telling us about the memory of the way in which we are you know writing the his our histories but also in which way can we uh, actually expand the the already existing uh, narratives with additional stories and how does our own approach to this material defines the way in which we are seeing 
a, a period of time. So, of course, um, private archive is this in this sense is also special because it is not part of the institution, but it, uh, in case of this archive, it is created by an artist who is still with us, and he's changing the pieces of it even today. So is his recreating his own stories and recreating his own memories through working with this historical material that he possess and in which in this way he's always uh, he's actually opening new windows and new questions that the researcher maybe can access through this through working with this material and also through talking with him um, so this is, uh, for instance, the material connected with the gallery that he had for 20 years in uh, Zagreb city center, uh, which was in the case of Croatia completely forgotten. It was open in 1980 and uh, um, there is no collect a recollection of it. And there were 48 uh, photographic exhibitions held there and artists from all around uh, Europe were coming to Zagreb and showing their uh, their photographs. So this is also one of the questions of how quickly we forget and how this kind of archives are actually uh, enabling us to remember this kind of events, especially if the collecting of institutional archives of this material was not continuous or didn't happen. So this material is actually not present in the state archive uh, in Zagreb. Okay, so this, uh, this is also one part of his work. It is called Liber Pero uh, series. Uh, and it was continued in the, uh, in the 90s. And this is actually really special because this adds a different layer and a different story to the perception of war in Croatia that happened in this period. So we also have this question of how this personal stories uh, and the narratives that we find in this kind of archives can actually enhance the official narratives, especially uh, in the situation how this war from the 90s is that we still have a lot of uh, debates in the, the sphere today about who, what and when and where this official narrative is constantly uh, this heroic uh, and victimizing story. But in this archive, we have some other layer that is not visible in, in this uh, public sphere. So this is also one one kind of plus that I uh, saw in this, um, in working with this archive. So uh, I would just like to finish uh, this part with um, um, this thought. Um, after this working in the archive, mapping its parts, seeing different parts of life uh, of an artist intertwine and uh, how they are adding or, or take away from some notions that we have about uh, Re recent events that happened, um, I started to see that this archive provides opportunities in researching the context, especially because the material is not uh, grouped by authors or by exhibitions, but chronologically. So it has this in inherent uh, narrative element. Um, and it is uh, but it, it's formed in this kind of groups where you have the artwork, maybe some clippings from the newspapers and so on combined together. So you have the legal document, uh, documents and the receipts combined with artistic pieces. So you have also this process of working and living combined with, uh, with the thing itself, with, with the material itself. And when the artist, the creator is grouping it together, um, it is different than when you approach into institutional uh, archive where pieces are, you know, separated uh, dependingly on the type of, of documentations do you see. So in how many ways is private archive able to shed light on the period during which it was created? How insightful can it be? And what do we do with this one archive, for instance, in Croatia, that is left to present an echo epoch with materials, evidence of informal and formal artistic connections, notions and have long that have long been forgotten, as well with documents that testify to the material condition of artistic production. So these are some of my questions from which I actually um, continue my research and, and do everything connected to this material. Yeah, this is from me now.
Okay, mute myself. Thank you very much, um, Lana. And now I um, uh, give the word to Anna Dobolsk to introduce her case. Okay. Uh, so hello, uh, I am not a researcher of my archive. My uh, I am a custodian, more a custodian, uh, because I inherited this uh, this archive after my father, and uh, who was a historian and. Uh, first in few words, I will describe uh, his, uh, his, his work and then the structure of the archive, and I will show you some examples. So Jerzy Topolski, uh, uh, who lived in 1928 to 1998, my father, was a Polish Marxist historian and theorist of history. Uh, for most of his life, he was uh, associated with Adam Mickiewicz University in Poznań, Poland, where he chaired the Institute of Early Modern History, history and Methodology of History. Uh, he was a member of the Polish Academy of Sciences and of boards of International Commission for, uh, for History and uh, Theory of Historiography and boards of editors of international journals, such as, for example, History and Theory or Storia della Storiografia. Uh, he, together with Jerzy Gmita and Leszek Nowak, uh, was a co-founder of the Poznan School of, Mo of Methodology, which combined non-orthodox interpretations of Marxism with elements of the analytical philosophy de developed in the Warsaw Lwów School and Karl Popper's philosophy of science. Topolski laid the foundations for a modern methodology of history as a separate research field. Its program was inspired by historical materialism as well as by new trends in the humanities and social sciences, in particular the analytical philosophy of history and narrativism. Uh, he also worked on early modern history and economic history. He was the author of about 30 books and co-author and editor of many other. Six of his books were published abroad and methodology of history translated into six languages. Uh, Jerzy Topolski was among others a visiting professor in the United States, Canada, Germany, Italy, France, uh, the Netherlands. Um, and the legacy he left behind is in major part currently stored in our family home in Poznań and managed mostly by my mother, Maria Donuta Łabenska Topolska and myself. Uh, the part of the legacy which concerned the doctoral seminar uh, he led uh, and the activity of the chair of methodology of history uh, after his death was left in the Institute of Adam Mickiewicz, uh, Institute of History of Adam Mickiewicz University. But besides that, every, all the materials are at our home. Uh, the legacy was being to some extent organized already by, uh, by my father during his life, uh, first by himself and later, uh, according to his recommendations, by his father, Władysław Topolski, and then by my mother, Maria Danuta, who also included some, the recommendations for organization of archived legacies of scholars that were issued in 1990 by the, by the archive of the Polish Academy of Sciences. Earlier, there were no regulations, no, no some such uh, guide, guidances uh, so for such legacies, for organizing such, such legacies. Uh, and this document assumes a certain structure and division of materials. However, it allows for other structure if that was an original organization of the material by the scholar. In our case, it was a will of Jerzy Topolski to give the archive in the future to the Polish Academy of Sciences, but respecting his own organizational structure. This personal approach is best visible in the way his correspondence is organized, not as in the recommendations divided into incoming and outgoing, but divided alphabetically into files of particular persons or institutions, while when a person writes on behalf of an, of an institution, a letter goes to the file of the institution, and uh, while a person writes on their own behalf, a letter goes to the file of that person. Also, there are cases concerning particular big projects or congresses, uh, organization of which took a lot of time, when related correspondence is not divided into person or institutions, but gathered around a case. Uh, and during a particular year, um, my father was collecting correspondence and other documents in his drawer. And then at the beginning of a new year, he was handing it over to my mother for further organization. And the aim was to separate the following groups before handing to the Polish Academy of Sciences. So first, biographical materials, 
including official documents, for example, appointments, nominations for academic institutions. Second, property materials. Three, correspondence, organized in the way I described. Four, materials concerning academic and administrative, the didactic and publishing activity in the country without official documents included in the biographical materials. Five, materials concerning international academic cooperation. Six, materials concerning social political activity. Seven, materials of academic writing. And eight, materials about the creator of the legacy. Nine, iconographic materials. 10, materials concerning the family. And 11, materials not concerning the creator of the legacy. So for example, we have some um, uh, articles or works uh, sent by the, 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 the authors of those uh, works to my father. And he also collected those. Um, at the same time, the collection uh, of published books uh, or copies of published articles of my father was also systematically gathered at home. In addition, my mother conducted a catalog of all works and bibli bibliography of uh, Topolsky's writings, which was published systematically in 1988, 1999, 2001, and was conducted until 2012. There are also press clippings and flyers concerning him as well as IDs, medals, diplomas, calendars. His calendars written, uh, written uh, by hand with a lot of additional information and providing a lot of context. Uh, for me, one of the most valuable findings is his, is his diary from 1950s when he was a visiting scholar in Paris. Um, so the described division of materials, which are in major part already organized by still being uh, processed by my mother, there are, this, they are still in, this, in the process. Um, generally, so this division generally resulted from the utilitarian uh, reasons. And it also is a reflection of the fact that it was a scholar himself who started organizing his legacy already during his life and not a successor or an archivist after his death. These utilitarian reasons meant generally that the collected materials were, were constantly being used by the author who wanted to have the most important or needed ones at hand in his study. And also my mom, uh, while she's organizing this, uh, sorting out this document, Sometimes he, she, she, she finds, uh, she still finds something that is uh, um, needed for our family, family matters. So, and then now I would like to show you some uh, photos. Okay, so. Mm -hmm. An exemplary file. And for example, here we have all these files concerning uh, the one of the books. So Zarzyw Polski, which was translated into English and German. And we have uh, gathered all the correspondence collect, uh, concerning uh, all these publications, all these editions uh, in these uh, files. And also all the um, manuscripts uh, of, the, of the book. Uh, so this is the correspondence uh, connected to this particular publication, including handwritten notes, uh, and uh, and the manuscript, including handwritten corrections. So this so subsequent, you know, stages of work are documented very, very in detail. Here and here is this uh, finding, uh, my favorite finding. So this uh, diary from 1950s, late 50s, from his travels in France and Spain. Uh, and this is uh, this is the uh, one of the iconographical um, objects in our archive, which actually is not going to the Polish Academy of Sciences, but to the Museum of uh, Anna Mickiewicz University. This is an portrait uh, from 1974, it's a curiosity, because this was, um, a, there was a series of portraits sponsored by the state, by the state um, depicting uh, work leaders in the socialist state. And my father got uh, him his, uh, his portrait. So we have this uh, also as a curiosity in our archive, but this will go to the, uh, to the, uh, to the museum. And here 
<laughs> how it's used. So there is currently a scholar, um, Jan Pomorski in Poland, who is working on a monograph on my father. It will, it's going to be an intellectual uh, history of my father, uh, methodological uh, contribution. So including not only thanks to the archive development of thought and the contacts which he had with other scholars, discussions, et cetera, et cetera, which can be reflected by the documents that he found there. And uh, one finding he already, he already used and uh, wrote about uh, is the lost, last, uh, my father, last book, which is lost, that we have a contract. So we have this document and we have the table of contents of that book, but the book is the manuscript is lost. So this uh, professor, Jan Pomorski, based on uh, Benz, based on this uh, table of content, which was found in our archive, uh, is uh, kind of uh, trying to reconstruct the, the thoughts uh, in the context of other works of my father that could be behind that new methodology of history at the beginning of the 21st century. And here also, I, I'm showing this is in Polish, but uh, and uh, there is this uh, chapter in this already published book um, about historical imagination, uh, where he is describing his work in our archive. Uh, so, uh, so, so, so it's uh, it's being used, and it's uh, it's really uh, helping in this kind of uh, intellectual history of. Uh, of of my father in this case, so I think I think it is a big um, advantage of this private of private archives. Okay, of um, of uh, famous uh, thinkers that you can also um, unpack uh, the way some works were created, not only the works itself. Are, are, are the historical sources, but all these sources gathered from this archive, including the correspondence with a lot of a lot of scholars, with uh, in which they exchanged thoughts, and so so the whole development of thought can be uh, discovered ba based on such an archive. Okay, so I will stop now, and then we'll answer a question that we will have. So thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Anna, we did have a small technical issue while you were showing, uh, uh, sharing the screen. We unfortunately uh, didn't see, uh, at least I didn't, um, all the pictures that you were showing. Do you mind going through them again? I, we can't hear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just start from I the will. first one. I yeah, will. Yeah, yeah. Yes, so yes, 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 yes. One moment. I think it was okay. I will. I probably because I. Yeah, yeah I probably. Uh, okay, so I yes. will just let's go to the second one. Yeah. So these now are we the, see. Uh huh. Yeah. This uh, here the documents concerning that book mm -hmm. and the handwritten uh, corrections on the manuscripts, and here is the diary. And here is, is this painting, this portrait from 74. And here is this last, uh, the book uh, in chapter in which is based on the work in our archive. And uh, the author is still working on, on the whole monograph on my father. Thank so, you very much. Now okay, we so it. that, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, all right. Thank you very much, Anna. And now I can be, give the word to Jana. To present her case. Mm -hmm. Hello, hello. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, it's an honor to be here. Let me share my screen and make sure that everybody can see all the images. Let's go from the beginning. All right. Uh, so let me first talk about our legacy, we have we deal with the legacy of Henrik Grinberg. Henrik Grinberg was born in Warsaw in Poland in 1936 and currently lives in McLean, which is a suburb of Washington, DC. He was a journalist, an actor, a playwright, and now he's primarily a novelist and a poet. 
Here are some examples of his work. These are his famous diaries. Uh, right now, he uh, also pub is publishing the fourth edition. Each of them is over 400 pages and they reflect his fascinating life. Henrik Grunberg is a Holocaust survivor. So you can imagine um, the first of these diaries is primarily about the Holocaust. And then he, I would say he's a survivor of communism in Poland. So the second of the diaries is about communism uh, and what, how he survived the difficult period. The third one is about his life in America because he did escape at some point and he settled here. And then the fourth one is about um, his health difficulties about which I will be talking later. So this quote, you know, we only have a little bit of time to explain <laughs> um, a little bit about his work, but this quote I think reflects very well uh, why I got interested in this author. He says, I have a triple personality. I'm an American, a Pole, and a Jew, in variable order. When it comes to my culture, I'm mostly Polish, which Jews are often upset about. When it comes to my feelings, I am a Jew. Physically and psychologically, I'm an American. I'm also triply lonely as a writer, as a Jew who writes in Polish, as a Polish writer writing on Jewish topics, and as a writer who writes in Polish in America. But that's all right, solitude is a writer's friend. So here you see the traits of Grenberg's personality and of his writing. First, you see how honest he is. Then you see his sense of humor and the distance to himself and also this in-depth self-reflection. Uh, and how did I meet Henrik Grinberg and how this whole story of, uh, of dealing with his legacy start? Uh, I was very interested uh, in his period as uh, he spent as an actor in the post-World War Jewish theater of Warsaw. Uh, my PhD thesis is, uh, as Anastasia already said, the topic is Yiddish theater after the war. And we don't know much about that period. Uh, until now, we basically uh, were sentenced to just read the publications from the communist era, and that was pretty limiting <laughs> for the contemporary research. So such people as Henrik Grinberg give us insight to, to that interesting period. Uh, and what makes it more, even more complicated, if you can make it more complicated, is that Grinberg grew up in that period when Jews were assimilated. So he, working in the theater, paradoxically, helped him explore his own Jewishness. And he says, the Jewish theater was for me an oasis of Jewish culture, which I instinctively missed while living on the desert where, once I matured, I felt more and more lonely. We performed mostly classical Jewish plays, and I learned how to be a Jew from them. The actors, almost all of them were a generation older than I was, were a living monument of the Jewish past. I felt as like I was in a time machine, which took me to the Jewish past. And just like Franz Kafka, I was enchanted by the ghosts of the Jewish theater. So you can imagine what those actors were for Grinberg. Grinberg is for me and my generation. <laughs> so here we see a few. Um, photographs from that period. It was only 10 years, but very formative years. Oops, I can't. I'm sorry, my screen froze and I guess I have to stop sharing for a second, uh, which is, mm -hmm. yes? Let me try again. I will try again. Um, but maybe that's good that it froze. It froze in the right moment because the next chapter of his life is completely different. So now we're jumping to the moment when I met Grunberg. And if you have questions about his life after his period in the theater, you can tell me 
Uh, but as I told you previously, I basically focus on his work in the theater. Um, so what happened? He immigrated to the United States and was a very um, energetic person, even as a senior. And one day he uh, was rowing on a Potomac River in Washington and a mosquito bit him. And what happened is he got infected with this horrible disease, the West Nile virus, and he got paralyzed. So from this energetic older person who can still function by himself, he became, as you see, pretty much dependent on other people. I met him at that period. I was working on my dissertation and um, I thought maybe if I interview him because I was uh, on the lookout for people who are still alive, who worked in the theater, maybe he'll give me half an hour of his time, an hour max. What happened was I came at 9 a.m. and I left at 2 a.m. That was one of the most interesting encounters in my whole life. And I think for him, it was the same because he met a young person who spoke Yiddish, his language, which he did not expect. Uh, what happened, it was, you know, as they call in Poland, the river interview, very long interview where he shared the insights of his career. And later on, he took me to other people who had similar stories in his environment, Polish Jews who immigrated to the United States. So I got even more insights about his generation. And during that visit, I also told Henrik about the nonprofit I have. See, it keeps freezing, I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't know why. Um, my apologies. I think I'll just close the presentation and reopen. It would be a boring session without, uh, without such difficulties, right? <laughs> All right. So during that visit, Henrik learned we have a nonprofit called the Yiddish Arts and Academics Association of North America. And the activities we hold are deep to you know, what, what his interests are, which we teach Yiddish, Hebrew, and Polish. We have Jewish and Polish book clubs, movie nights and concerts. We have performances in all those languages, Yiddish, Polish, and Hebrew, and also art exhibits. So for him, he felt like his legacy would be a great contribution to the organization. And thanks to his help, we were, we were uh, able to open a physical location called Yiddish in California in San Diego. And you can see only a little bit of the exhibit. Uh, basically, half of our exhibit is his uh, legacy. This is a picture of the interior. And we could see this is his caricature on the Potomac River <laughs> rowing. We have his books, his articles and poems, all kinds of certificates, diplomas, literary prizes, and, you know, in communist period, a popular prize, literary prize was a painting. So we have also a lot of artwork obtained by Henrik Grinberg. And finally, my favorite part are the pictures of Henrik Grinberg on stage. And I would like to share one of those. And it will show you how much we can learn from from his from his collection. Yes. So here we have him with big stars of the Yiddish theater, Ida Kaminska, the founder of the communist era Yiddish theater in Warsaw, and Arthur Miller. And this is where they are watching a rehearsal of All My Sons in Yiddish. So this is a very, very important picture. And I'll show you other, oh, now it works. <laughs> um, other examples of the collection. So here we have all 
the, just a few examples. One example of the literary award, Alfred Jurzykowski Foundation. And then we have his MA diploma from the University of California in Los Angeles and uh, the Doctor of Hebrew Letters Honoris Causa Diploma that he got from Spertus College. And during, so I, as I mentioned, when I interviewed Greenberg, he introduced me to other poets, writers, actors who currently reside in Washington DC. And as you see from this poster, uh, he was immersed in this intellectual uh, circles, including Czesław Miłosz and Stanisław Barańczak. This is one of the, are, should I be done? No, this is one of the artworks that um, uh, I wanted to show you that steers emotions. Maybe I can talk about it a little bit later. Uh, one of the more, most controversial pieces in our gallery and by Leben, Jan Lebenstein. And this uh, is, I think, this was mentioned by other presenters before, like what do we do with the legacy? Uh, what are the alternative ways of presenting it and making it accessible to the audience? So that's one of the ways in our location, we hold all kinds of concerts, presentations, lectures. And I think people who are surrounded by art experience the music in the language, the art was written, the literature was written and the art was created, makes it more alive and accessible to the public. And here we have happy ending of this presentation of the story. This was a picture taken after Henrik Grunberg was informed that uh, we opened the Yiddishland exhibit where he, uh, he can present his life and legacy. So this is it for me. If you have additional questions, I know I skipped a lot of uh, information about Greenberg, but I would like also like to encourage the audience to learn about him and his life by themselves, read his book, read his poems, and learn about Yiddishan California a little bit more on their own. <laughs> Thank, you Thank you so much. much. Thank you very much, Jana. Now, let us move to the discussion. And the discussion uh, is divided in two parts. We'll first discuss with all the panelists, of course, uh, the practical aspects of curating this private and personal archives. And then we'll uh, speak about um, epistemological potential that we, we already spoke about a bit of using these uh, private and personal archives for research, but also for artistic practices. Now, my first question would be, to all the panelists, and then please uh, feel free to answer in uh, whatever order you prefer. So based on your experience of curating or preserving these three um, similar but also very different archives, which aspects of custodianship would you consider specific for curating, for the practice of curating these private or personal material? And I mean here, of course, both in practical, from practical perspective, but also on, on ethical level. Thank you. Okay, Anna, will you first or I will I, unmute it at the same time? Yeah, <laughs> okay, so I, sh I will be quick. Um, first of all, uh, because uh, I deal, we deal here with a lot of correspondence with people who are still alive, and uh, there is this law uh, protecting, um, protecting uh, personal da data. So uh, I, I, I'm not allowed to, you know, uh, make accessible all, all the materials. It's, it's just the European law. So, uh, so this is the practical, one of the practical things. It's a, uh, another is that a lot of these materials, uh, we still, uh, we still have, to, because we are organizing it by ourselves before giving it to the Polish Academy of Science, because there's a lot of materials that we need to keep at home because they are, they are needed, like property documents, or, uh, for example, my mom found, uh, uh, found some document that was, uh, like, going through some 
academic staff, a document that uh, allowed her to apply for a higher pension because it was uh, it was um, some uh, some insurance document from early fifties or something. So 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 my mom, my mom said before I go through everything on my own, I can't give it away because there might be things we need. So so this is another like practical way, a practical thing that we have to um, we have to think about and uh, and that's why it also takes time before we prepare it to to to, to hand it to the institution uh, and uh, also when a researcher come, researchers come to us we uh, we are kind of mediators between the archive and them so we uh, they interview us and my mom remembers uh, a lot from uh, from my father' life, uh, from from uh, about contacts he had, so he her stories are um, a part of the research work that is done in the archive. So I think this is also uh, specific for a private archive that is uh, a legacy that is stored at home and by by family. Uh, and these stories, I sometimes even I can find in the in the writings in the book that I showed you. There is this. Kind of a storytelling uh, motif uh, of of the visit in the archive uh, uh, just before the author discusses the methodological issues that my father worked on. So this is uh, you can now go. Well, well uh, in my case, I mean this is actually an artist estate uh, which is vast. So uh, when I call it an archive and refer to it uh, as an archive, it's uh, because it has this structure that is imposed on it. So it is uh, in a way curated by the creator himself. But what is the specific, uh, what is specific in it? This is, uh, I think that in most part, this question of it's uh, shifting and reshaping all the time. For instance, last month there was a 100th anniversary of uh, of birth of this important uh, art historian and artist uh, from uh, ex Yugoslavia, with whom Pero was in contact, and he actually did his exhibition uh, in his gallery. And when this happened, Pero started to take bits and pieces connected to this uh, this art historian and put it in a new file so he kind of you know took something that we perceive as a historical document that he arranged in the first time as a part of an exhibition or as a part of some i don't know catalog series or something and now he you know took all of these bits and pieces and put it in a new folder and now we have a new story and this story could be you know named pero and micha basicevic so i think this part when a creator is still you know bringing new things and reshaping his own uh history his own stories and you know maybe since we are talking about older an older gentleman he's recollecting or forgetting or remembering different pieces of the puzzle so i think this is also revealing in itself because it's not only you know it, it gives us this more to to the dry historical material without this you know leaving aura around it and um, i don't think that this is a case in the, this is a question when we are discussing the questions of ethic uh when that this is not so connected to the archive that I am working in. Uh, but we also have this question, you know, all of us don't like to remember maybe some pieces of our past. So maybe there are things that are being erased. Uh, I was doing some interviews a couple of weeks ago with uh, one curator from Austria, and she's also arranging now her archive, private archive estate, and she has a shredder by her side. And she said, you know, this shredder is working every day. So we also have this question of erasure of one's own history and how somebody who is creating an archive as this kind of conscience, you know, conscience body of documents and stories, which stories is he, uh, you know, preserving, which is he or she trying to delete. And 
then how we as interpreters, researchers, how we are then perceiving these stories and how we will interpret them, interpret them in the future. Mm -hmm. My turn. <laughs> uh, yes, it's a it's a big question that you asked. And just to answer briefly, well, Grunberg's like life also has this private element to it. For instance, um, his daughter died in some tragic circumstances. I'm not sure exactly what happened. We have a painting that was done by her when she was 12, but that's the only piece of information about her I have. And I haven't yet asked him. I didn't want to overwhelm him. You know, at some point I will ask, maybe, maybe not. Uh, I'm not sure if this pri private information is relevant to the exhibit at all. I know people who visit the exhibit will ask, did Grunberg have family? What happened to his family? Um, so I'll have to think how to deal with this issue in the future. For now, this is a missing piece of information that is not disclosed there. And then there is this big, big issue of the communist era and what all of these people we had, we had we, we heard about today. What did they do? What was their involvement with the government? As we know from history, lots of them, lots of people were informers or we don't really know if they were informers. Would they sign something? Did they actually do anything? Uh, I checked that with Henry Grinberg. I didn't get any solid data, anything conclusive. So again, this part is not a part of the exhibit because I don't have any conclusive answers. And I did my homework. <laughs> so I went to the secret archives in Warsaw. I checked, there is nothing there that would tell me yes or no. We just don't have the answer to this, which we do have answers with other people who worked at the theater at the time. But here, just we don't know. So again, this is something that is omitted in the exhibit. And finally, what I noticed with our audiences, uh, and I think that's just a psychological thing that everybody can relate to, people want simple answers. So the notion that Grinberg lived first through communism, then through, uh, sorry, first through Holocaust, then through communism, then through capitalism, it's too complicated for one exhibit. So my idea is that we would handle it by topic. First topic could be Holocaust. And then we only deal with that part of his life. Then we have Yiddish theater. We only deal with Yiddish theater. That's an exhibit only about it, nothing else. And then we have his life in America or his life as a journalist. Uh, and that would help people understand um, this, the history better, because if we throw everything at the audience at the same time, especially American audience, there is so much to explain within a, a historical context that will be not digestible. Um, that's why I left some of the parts of Henrik's life behind in this presentation, because that would get too complicated. So I think the best way to approach it is bit by bit. Thank you. Thank you. My next question, in my next question, I would like to ask you to further reflect on this in two cases uh, out of three that we discuss here to this rather unique situation when the creators of these archives are, uh, first of all, uh, alive, yeah, in uh, Lana's and Yana's case, and also the willingly, as far as I understood, right, uh, gave these archives and the custodianship. And here, we'd like to ask you to reflect um, on this notion on intervention. So like uh, um, Lana said, there, there was a case, right, of the author intervening in the archive. And how um, and to what extent, in your opinion, this sort of changes, right, the, the, the structure of the archive that you um, or that you received under custodianship? And is it, is it a living archive uh, as long as the person who created it um, is also alive, and the same question goes to Jana, of course, and then for Anna's case, how would you define your own intervention into the archive, and then again, to what extent it is, it, it, it is a living archive or not, or, or an archive in dynamic? Thank you. 
Well, I I actually think that uh, when you are working in with this kind of, this type of material with a living owner of it and creator of it, um, I think that then this uh, sense of difference between a historical document and of life being lived and then I don't know these things are you know things for from your past or from your everyday lives and so on. you get this kind of difference uh, for instance the the exhibition uh, setup I showed from this Liber Pero series that were those photographs the, the gallery filled with photographs from bottom till till top uh, this is one really interesting artwork uh, that when you put it in an exhibition space looks like this non-linear non-narrative uh, bunch of black and white mostly black and white photographs but what uh, uh, Pero did he actually started to uh, to write names of the people on the photographs on each of these photographs so uh, you get different kind of level and then when we were looking through this material he was telling me a story connected to each and every one of these photographs so in a sense you get this different uh, different set of information and of knowledge that uh, you wouldn't be allowed you wouldn't know probably if you saw this in some institutional archive without the person who who created it so uh, i wouldn't say that it's this, this is something that characterizes an archive as a living archive. I think that this is something that it's connected like archive in motion or archive shifting and reshaping all the time. And that has this additional storytelling uh, level uh, all the time. Uh, but this notion of living archive, this is something that is really important to me is the question the question what do we do with the archive and maybe this is also connected to the question of physical uh, preservation because when we think of physical preservation and especially of an archive such as this that is f full of photographies that are you know this material that easily deteriorates if you don't preserve it uh, with all of those uh, non-acid uh, I don't know materials and put it in boxes and so on if you conserve it one of the parts is not to touch it but when it's still you know in a house with the person who created it you're able to move the objects to touch them he's rearranging them you know we are uh, uh going through his books and diaries and then we are doing stuff with it so it's not confined to some research in a library or something but is used to promote his work to promote uh, work of other artists. It is also used for young scholars to to uh, discuss the methodologies or different parts of history. So I think that this is living archive. If you have an archive with which you are working all the time and with which you are creating some kind of uh, new formats like Johanna is doing with the Greenberg archive. So um, I think this is some two parts that can be separate. But in any case, I think that uh, um, when working with any kind of historical documents, um, this opportunity to do interviews and to talk with people and um, just to put, you know, color and sense and feelings into uh, th this papers and, and residues of material culture uh, is bringing more knowledge to the whole and it's enabling us to, to see the, the greater picture. Well, I can go yeah, next. Any, anyway, yeah, sure. OK. <laughs> so with Grunberg, uh, initially, I was very excited that we could have him at uh, the exhibit, maybe have interviews with him, and maybe we can have Q&A with the audience. But unfortunately, he's not mobile enough to come to California to interact with uh, us, which is too bad. Um, and also, we tried doing it via Zoom, but that didn't work either because it's not that easy for him to operate Zoom at his age. Um, so that one didn't work. What does work, ironically, is interacting with Grinberg through Facebook. 
which I have mixed <laughs> mixed feelings about Facebook in general. And I've never have expected that that would be the way to interact uh, with him. But apparently he very much enjoys running his Facebook fan page and people are very excited that they found a way to interact with him. So I'm not sure if there is a way to, to actually have Facebook posts presented in the archive. That might be going too far, um, but it does help to have, you know, he's also hard of hearing. So this Facebook messenger or email, there are other forms of communication. Maybe we could do something like, uh, chat a chat a, fa a chat on facebook messenger with Henrik greenberg that could be an event that we're having at the gallery and he could uh, talk to us in yiddish he would talk to us in hebrew and in polish through the chat so it really opens the door uh, which is unexpected i've never seen any gallery slash uh, archive using facebook before <laughs> Um, so it's an interesting approach uh, how Facebook could potentially make an archive or an exhibit, a living archive and living exhibit. Thank yes, you. just a few thoughts. <laughs> okay. um, and even if the case of the archive uh, of Fierzdopolski, which uh, we have at our home, uh, even if uh, he is uh, not alive for over 20 years, I can still say that it's kind of um, living archive because uh, of my mother who uh, provides the context to the archive and, um, and her storytelling around always when a researcher is coming to uh, dig into the documents uh, also helps in uh, helps in, in getting more information help also guides them in where to look for several uh, particular information particular documents because she knows uh, she knows mostly what's there and uh, so she's a guide uh, she's a mediator she's a, a storyteller um and uh, what else um, uh, yeah and she she's physically arranging it uh, so i think this uh, this this still is also in, in the case of 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 my father kind of living archive um yeah mm -hmm. thank you very much anna now let us move to the second part of our discussion and to actually discuss the the contents of uh, of these archives um so i would ask all of you what in your view are the tropes through which Petr Davos, Jerzy Topolski, and Henry Greenberg were narrating themselves with the help of these private archives. And which aspects of their biographies then are highlighted in these archives that, let's say, would be untraceable in other collections or public archives? Thank you. Uh, well, um... I, for instance, uh, what I found interesting is uh, and that I connected somehow with the way in which we are remembering our lives, since we all have some parts of it that are more, that are more intensive and that we remember more clearly than other, that this is in a way reflected uh, in a way that he was uh, collecting material connected to some of this, uh, some of different parts of his life. Um, and you know it reflects the period in, in which he was learning more, uh, the period in which he was uh, feeling more more emotionally exposed or maybe you know more emotionally involved. It was if it was connected maybe to some you know intimate relationship or, or situation. Then there is material that is organized in a more um, systematic way. If he was more like industrial steward, so you can sense the different approaches to different kind of materials connected to his own feelings about the period. And uh, then when we are discussing and discussing it, I can also see the different uh, amount of memory that remained connected to this or that material, which is also really uh, interesting 
interesting in connection with it. So I think that also this internal structure and you know concentration of materials and the way it is uh, arranged, connected to different periods or events, is also also very much telling about this personal story that is unfolding, uh, and that is also some kind of you know additional knowledge uh, that is maybe then maybe, but that, that is important not only to, to this uh, autobiographical element, the biographical element, but also to, to maybe uh, discussing how are we remembering our lives. Thank you. If, um, if I think about the archive of my father, uh, what's mostly visible is uh, how important for him was historical science, historical knowledge. And that's the major part. Uh, for example, he also uh, was uh, gathering, collecting uh, some um, uh, lectures or uh, presentations that he was copies of which he, he was bringing from abroad uh, to Poland to then distribute among his uh, students, for example, or colleagues, uh, which were not accessible that easily in the communist time knowledge to the Western, uh, access to the Western knowledge was not that easy. So uh, so, 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 so he, a large part of this collection uh, is um, workshop materials that he was bringing also from abroad. So I think that this is like this mission that he had like to also bridge open the uh, Polish no, uh, Polish uh, science historical science to bridge between the uh, Western uh, and 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 Eastern uh, circles no, knowledge circles academic circles so that um, but then when you also uh, for example read the memoir from his uh, young 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 years uh, from his travels academic travels, you can see how uh, his character, so how he was um, very um, cheerful person, very friendly, with uh, open to uh, to other people and helpful. Well, that also can be can is reflected in some documents, for example, when he was writing some letter of support for some of his colleagues who were, for example, imprisoned during communism. So you can you can see uh, this uh, this la layer of his uh, activity very uh, you know very 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 um, social and uh, friendly, right? Because he was very very helpful, and when he could use his authority and to help somebody, he will he would do that. Uh, so that is uh, reflected uh, when you are looking for uh, the traits of his character. But of the organization, I would say that the most important part is his uh, mission to uh, contribute to and uh, to promote knowledge, historical knowledge, develop this uh, this field. Um, yeah, and uh, well, um, personal information that are also there. Uh, so for example, letters with uh, his family members, et cetera, et cetera. So that is not erased because my father was, <laughs> as my mom said, he was even preserving train, uh, train tickets or tram tickets. So he was really crazy about like preserving almost everything. Um, and um, I don't. I don't know if he was doing any sales or self censorship. Maybe we, I. I can't ask him any longer. But he was like preserving all this, and he was very very organized person, which is also reflected by the archive, by the fact that he created himself the archive. This his his his, his own archive. They're like a very organized and uh, uh, hardworking person. So that also can be read. Okay. Thank you. I will. Thank you, Anna. Uh, now, we are slightly running out of time, as it usually happens. Therefore, before I give a uh, word to Jana, I will kindly ask the audience to start uh, maybe indicating whether you have questions. Uh, I'm sure you do. Um, you might either write it in the chat or raise your hand. Um, and meanwhile, I'll give uh, the floor to Jana, please. This, this question. Thanks. Um, yes, that was a good question that Anna raised. How do we write diaries that we know that will somebody will read them and uh, they are for publication? And how do we write the diaries if they are just 
a self-reflection, you know, that will, we hope that nobody will touch until we die. <laughs> it's a completely different way of writing. And from Grunberg's uh, diaries that were obviously written for publication, one message comes across very strongly, which is that a huge need to improve uh, Polish-Jewish relationships, which we see nowadays how vital it is and will always be. And uh, this also corresponds with the mission of uh, my nonprofit. And thanks to that, um, we're also organize, creating a chapter of Polish-Jewish dialogue. And Grenberg will be serving us as a prime example of how we could improve the understanding of those cultures, how we can um, unfold all these complications in our history because all the animosities happen for a reason. And if I think the deep understanding of historical uh, context of what happened exactly, if we look at the data uh, very carefully, uh, not oversimplifying uh, the facts and how you look at them, that can help us improve those relationships. But maybe it's just me, I do see a big trend in academia, in politics, everywhere to overlay, oversimplify things. <laughs> and it bothers me and I see it bothers Greenberg as well. Um, things are complicated and there is no way there is no other biography than a complicated biography. And we just have to face it. We have to try to understand it. It's not easy. Our brain is wired that way. We want things simple. But everybody who runs any kind of archive, art gallery or any institution knows that's not the case. I think that's one of the biggest challenges, um, how to, organize it in a matter, in such a matter that it's approachable and it contributes to the understanding, better understanding of history. Thank you very much, Jana. Thank you. I don't see any questions in the chat or raised hands, but dear audience, if you do have questions, now is the time to ask them. No? Wait. Uh, no, I don't see. Anyhow, the, you could still use the chat. Then uh, let me ask the question that was um, actually in the core of uh, the description of this event while it was in, uh, in preparation. So what is, in your opinion, or how would you define this epistemological potential of the uninstitutionalized and partially unstructured material that is held in the archives that, that you curate and preserve. Um, so what is this potential for researchers, and especially, of course, for researchers in memory studies, as this is the MSA, but also for, uh, for artists or for, in fact, anybody interested? Thank you. Well, I, I think that uh, this kind of archives, I mean, you know, when, when an institution takes a material, they have uh, this kind of rules that they have to apply, but they will never preserve everything. That is the first question. They will throw away something. And some of the stuff that uh, have the need for this special protection and special conditions will be taken out of the hole and, and uh, relocated and so on. And then, of course, the way in which we are creating archive uh, catalogs and, you know, metadata, metadata and uh, so on. This is also one kind of um, structure of understanding things. And uh, this is something that you don't have in a private archive. The, the structure is in a way open. So, you know, don't have this kind of pre defined categories and uh, hierarchy of information through which you are looking to find different bits and pieces. Moreover, you don't have any kind of, uh, I don't know, list on through which you can uh, look to every, you know, uh, piece and bit of the archive. So uh, you have a greater kind of liberty because you are, I think that you are not constrained with uh, these institutional arrangements. 
And of course, in uh, if you have this archive that, that is changing, that is shifting, and in which this kind of rearrangement of material and coexistence of different kinds of uh, documents is possible. And uh, you can also you know, participate in the rearrangement then it uh, offers a lot more opportunities to create knowledge or extract knowledge from from the information and uh, from the uh, from the yes from the documents and information that you gather and i think that also this is super important in our uh, artistic um, in artistic creation and especially when you have archive of an artist of a visual artist uh, I think that if you want it to be a working, living archive, the contact between younger generation and the older generation through working in archive is a form of transgenerational exchange between these artists. But this is also a way in which young artists can interpret something that was created in some different past, uh, different times, and so on. But to uh, recognize what is still significant for us today and in which way it could be translated into a new new work of art. I don't hear you, Anastasia. Yeah, yeah, yeah please, please oh, go ahead. Okay, yeah, okay. So, uh, so yeah, um, first, um, first of all, uh, I think that it's a different uh, kind of research that is done uh, in kind of in this private archive and in a bigger institutional archive. For example, this diary, diary of my father is not an example of a diary of a young person traveling abroad to, uh, to the Western uh, academia, academia from Eastern uh, bloc. It's not, it's inherent to the whole history and whole context of this person, particular person, Jerzy Topolski and his whole uh, story. Uh, so, so it's uh, so in this way, this uh, private art are, are more personal. The personal stories, of first of all, and uh, and what I already said in the beginning, uh, with the potential um, for researchers is that it's possible. Uh, for example, on the example of an uh, intellectual, it's uh, possible to um, unpack whole the whole intellectual history of his thought of his methodological thought so the researcher doesn't have only uh, only don't have uh, only um, the, the the works the books and uh, that he is uh, interpreting but also the whole manus the whole series of manuscripts leading to that book and the correspondence around that so he can write this uh, kind of uh, more uh, immersed intellectual history of the uh, philosophical thought, methodological thought of, in this case, my father. But I think going even more abstract thinking about what like private archives and, and memory, memory studies. So, well, we can ask the question about the memory and archive, this relationship between memory and archive. So, because on the one hand, we have this uh, thesis that uh, by Pierre Nora, uh, that was also in the description of our event, that the, our memories are archival. On the other hand, we have this thesis by Derrida that uh, archive works like memory, this, uh, that it distorts, that it suppresses, that it uh, selectively remembers. So, uh, I would say that there is this reciprocal relationship between memory and archive in the Western world, in the very core of the Western identity formation and in which memory takes part. Uh, and uh, also the, the archive as a commemoration of a person, like this desire to live uh, forever. So this, uh, so we can, we can ask the, these questions on this uh, several several le levels of inquiry. Mm, okay. Thank you. And Jana? Now I think there is like one minute left. And how do we go no, no, from no, what... no, no worries, no worries. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody is speaking. <laughs> uh, yes. Um, I don't know if I can follow up on those philosophical divagations. 
uh, very interesting and deep thoughts. Um, I, I think, well, speaking for my own organization, the mission is, yes, people pr preserve things not to die, to live forever. But what kind of life is it if you are in a mausoleum, at the cemetery, some archives you go in and you feel like there is no life there. So how the challenge is how to make it feel alive, relevant for young people, uh, especially young people, because uh, we have to shape the intellectual future for our, for the future generations, like how do we do that? Uh, so this is why, uh, yes, in our space at least, we bring young artists and young scholars and they can interact uh, with um, the literature and the artwork that we have stored there. Uh, as you saw the example of one, one event we were holding there. Um, and also, I think the issue of the location where you locate the archive uh, gallery, whatever it is, is very important because we are located on the West Coast. I think Greenberg made a very smart decision to give his legacy to us versus uh, some DC-based institution or a Polish institution because he's already famous there. And the fact that we are based on the West Coast helps spread his legacy much further. Uh, so that, that is a very smart decision. And also, Greenberg knows we have um, audiences who represent different groups, speaking Yiddish, speaking Polish, and speaking Hebrew. All of these audiences have different expectations. And you can tell by the translations of Greenberg's literature that Hebrew-speaking audience has different needs. Yiddish-speaking audience has different needs, and Pol of course, Polish-speaking audience has completely different things. Uh, so uh, different um, interests. So again, the more you spread the knowledge, the better, and the more in a more lively way, the better. <laughs> that was a practical answer, not philosophical answer. <laughs> No, 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 but this was, you know, this was a very practical and fast question, you know, what, you know, what can we as researchers or, or artists or, as I said, anybody else, right, take from this archive that uh, also take into account that one doesn't need to go to and uh, sign in, right? To an institution and, and wait for several days to get access mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. So, um, right, right, right. Um, this is, uh, of course, is um, slightly different to distance also, and there would be many other concepts that uh, we might be willing to discuss. Um, however, I'm afraid we are, um, our time uh, is up. I do not see any questions in the chat, and I do not see any raised hands, but there are um, thanks in the chat, and I uh, <laughs> encourage our panelists to uh, read them through. Um, then if you would like uh, to have any words in conclusion, please go ahead. Well, on my behalf, uh, I don't know, uh, I am, uh, I might say that uh, for me, this kind of, uh, this questions of private archive, I mean, we all know that it are Foucault and the question of institutional archive are tackled and uh, are very popular, but this question of uh, private archives, informal structures, and this type of knowledge, I think this is a field in which we have still much to, to research and much to think on about. And especially since uh, there is this great ongoing discussion uh, of what will we do with the estates and archives that will come to our societies in years to come. I mean, the artists that were active in the 60s, 70s, 80s, their estates and archives should be now, uh, in a way, handled, so to say, uh, or much of the material uh, will be lost. And then uh, there is also a question, how much of it should be even preserved if we know that we are living in a time of archive fever and that everything is everyone is preserving everything so do we need this much of material and 
how and can we uh, you know take something out of it in the end and what is the thing that is most most valuable from it thank you very much Jana? Uh -huh. Yeah, would it would it be the train tickets <laughs> that we should preserve, <laughs> or something else? Well, there is also a different aspect that we didn't talk about. The <laughs> at least in Eastern Europe, there is this yucky feeling about the communist era, and at least when I was growing up, nobody wanted to hear about it. Nobody was interested in it because it was the time of the history we were ashamed of, and only slowly, I think, very recently. Uh, research on that era is coming to the surface and that's something that we don't have answers yet to because it's just simply too early um, there will at least we need at least uh, 50 years i think to unfold uh, all of these convoluted uh, details of the communist era i think so yes that's another no, I'm just saying also come to Budapest, we have a lot of this. <laughs> <laughs> of course you do. <laughs> Mm. Uh, and I, I would like to add different aspects of living in communism and opportunities. I mean, what I've, I mean, okay, Yugoslavia was different than Eastern Bloc, and I think that this should be emphasized every mm -hmm. time it's possible. Mm -hmm. But uh, this, uh, uh, how, I mean, I was working in a gallery for a period of time, and to bring an uh, a photographic e exhibition from some artists from some other country is almost impossible because it is mm. really expensive to transport it, then to furnish it, and so on. And in the 70s and in the 80s, they put their photographs in, you know, uh, the in the post office and send it all the way. So you had this kind of exchange where you didn't have censorship or I don't know some situation like, for instance, in Hungary. So these stories are also interesting. How they managed to communicate, how how they were exchanging, and this is something that I mean, there are a couple of horrible, horrible projects here in Europe that are talking about dissidents, about, you know, censorships and so on, not emphasizing the opportunities that were then and that are not now because this system has also its downfalls. So I think these private archives also, you know, give opportunities for these aspects beyond the two totalitarian Yezinisms, uh, narratives and so on. Sorry. Thank you, Hannah. Uh, Anna, would you like to have a word in conclusion? Well, I just uh, I would like to thank you for uh, inviting me and for uh, for listening, uh, for talking. Uh, so, uh, if anyone uh, is interested in uh, in doing research in my archive, then we <laughs> we just uh, need an email to me. Uh, and then we set up meetings so it's it's still uh, all the time being in use also for uh, not only knowledge on my father but also uh, for the knowledge on other people with whom he worked uh, so for example recently i had a, um, a researcher uh, asking about some uh, german scholar with whom my father was in a close contact so i found so much information that was not preserved on that person elsewhere just in my archive so um, that's uh, a very much more richer uh, source than just uh, concerning one person um, and and the context of that person um, there are so many layers uh, but i just will stop here <laughs> and thank you <laughs> thank you very much and, and i would like to emphasize this um uh, slip of the tongue, right? About my archive, and this is also another another level of this. I, I actually do exactly. myself. No, so yeah, uh -huh. a year and a half yeah. working yeah. in this archive, and I yeah. call it yeah. my yeah. my Slavic collection, my <laughs> Jewish collection. <laughs> that is, of course, another yes. layer. Exactly, right? exactly, yeah. exactly. To discuss.
but yeah. um, if we had another hour and a half, we could have definitely done it. But um, unfortunately, our time is up. I don't, it's the third time I'm not saying it. Thank you very much, <laughs> uh, dear panelists. Thank you very much, dear audience, especially those who stayed with us till the very end. Thank you, Maria, for insightful um, comments in the chat. Please, everybody, um, read uh, this through. And um, I then... Um, invite um, all of us and uh, all of the audience to follow the uh, digital MSA uh, and please check the website for the further announcements. Thank you very much. And I would like to yeah, say sure. follow POSOCOMES online events. Yes, well. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yes, on December 6th, we are actually discussing, uh, we are discussing the book on um, exhibitions uh, on the war, on exhibiting the war uh, in the, and several uh, museum, like Second World War across the globe. Yes, you're very, you're very welcome.